Hey guys, welcome to EDM Tips. I'm very excited today to be interviewing Adam Turner, head A&R manager at Enhanced Music. He looks after two labels there, Enhanced Progressive, which is a bit more banging trance, and Colorized Music, which focuses more on beautiful, melody-driven, deep and melodic house. There's some great music on both labels, but a couple of our Accelerator students actually release on Colorized as well, Molly and Helms, whose music you can check out below. Now, Adam isn't only an A&R manager, he also produces under the name Farius and has had support and plays from big DJs such as Armin Van Buren and Above and Beyond. The records he's helped produce and release have had millions of streams and regular play on radio stations such as Sirius XM, Radio 1 and KISS FM. In our interview today, we go into what it takes to get signed to a respected label, the hardships that A&R managers face, the benefits of signing to a label versus self-release, the things that are going to increase your chances of getting signed and the things that will absolutely destroy them. We also go into what Adam personally thinks about AI and how it's going to affect the future of the music industry. Juicy and pertinent stuff. Thank you to everyone in the community who submitted the questions for me to ask and without further ado, let's meet Adam. Adam, thank you for joining me on the EDM Tips channel. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know you yet, perhaps you could give a brief introduction um, of who you are and what you do and Colorize. Yeah, my name's Adam. I am the A&R manager for Colorize, which is a label that's a part of Enhanced Music, um, which is a, a larger label group that's been founded 50 years ago. And uh, yeah, I look after the uh, two labels here, Enhanced Progressive, which is more of a trance-leaning label, and Colorize, which is obviously what we're here to talk about today. Excellent. Well, once again, thanks for joining me. I know we've got lots of my students and lots of the viewers of this channel who absolutely love Colorize. Great. I'm a personal fan as well. That's my jam, as great. it were. Nice. So yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. I've got some great questions from the community. So the first one would be, what does an A&R manager actually do? Good question, because I often have to tell my mates who don't work in music what exactly A&R stands for and what it is. So I'm used to this one. A&R technically stands for artists and repertoire. Essentially, the way I look at it is that I am the link between the record label and the artist in a creative capacity. So my job really, um, I mean, maybe we'll talk about my day to day, but my job over overview really is to ensure that we work with artists to get the best possible sound out of their records. And and that is that's the headline, really. Um, and that can mean anything from feedback i mean that is the main thing it's feedback on their records when i get sent demos to um even doing a bit of creative work myself on the records every now and then or working with some other engineers other producers linking people together um yeah just being that that person who when an artist potentially has their first contact with a label it's usually with me or one of the other a and r's and as the a and r manager i kind of just oversee um, the the output from an A&R capacity work with the team really closely but um, but just kind of oversee how the how the sound of the label is is going if that makes sense yeah and you touched on something that was quite interesting there that you say you have some creative input yourself so are you a producer and DJ and and how did you end up in the situation where you're now A&R manager so I am, yeah, I'm a producer and a DJ. Um, for some of your um, community, they might know me as Farius. That is my artist name. And I mainly produce uh, progressive and trance, kind of the more banging end of <laughs> of what we do here. I'm technically signed as an artist to enhance progressive. And yeah, I've been doing music production and DJing. Well, DJing since I was about 13 years old. So I kind of know my way around a pair of decks, although put me in front of those new ones they just brought out and I wouldn't know what I'm doing yet um <laughs> uh and producing since I was about uh 22 so about 15 years or so and yeah I kind of started out in the major label world doing remixes for cash for big uh pop stars people like Ollie Murs, Paloma Faith, Robbie Williams people like that in the commercial world and then kind of refined what I wanted to do started a new alias which is Farius and that's been going since 2016 and now I make records and put them out on labels like Enhanced and Juno Beats uh, Armada and and others so so that's kind of my background in terms of getting into a and R. I'll keep it short but it was it was basically during COVID I was I was just DJing I was just producing I was traveling a lot and I got a call from Will Holland who's the label director here who said would you like to do some A&R for us 
And uh, long story short, I, I ended up saying yes. And um, four years later, I'm still here, still doing it. Excellent. Yeah. So you've got a nice long history in music production. It's, and then you were, I guess, sought out by Will off the back of the quality of your, your work. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose so. That's yeah. very flattering. Nice. But, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's flattering, but it's the truth. <laughs> cool. So you mentioned, you know, your. Well, you didn't maybe, but um, I guess the first thing to ask was what your day-to-day looks like as an A&R. I think the main bulk of what I end up doing day-to-day is listening to music, as anyone would expect of an A&R. My inbox, uh, every time I clear it, it gets full again. So I just tackle that inbox every day with demos for Colorized, but also for Enhanced Progressive and some of the other labels as well, which I then divert to some of the other A&Rs here. But yeah, essentially listening to music, seeing what works, seeing what aligns with our sound first and foremost, and then either going back to the artist and saying, yeah, we, we like this, I'm going to listen to it with the rest of the, the A&R team. We have two A&R meetings a week here at Enhanced at Colorize, um, where we listen to all the new music that's coming and all the records that we're currently working on with artists as well to kind of... I think it's a it's a great way of working here. It's a completely democracy. So my decision isn't always the sole decision whether a record gets signed here or not. We have a team of two other A and Rs and and the director, and we listen to it all together. And it's always kind of like a a, a collective decision on on what we do on the music. Um, but back to the the day to day, it's working with artists, emailing them back saying we like this or it's not quite right for us, um, but keep sending us your stuff or moving forward saying we really like this. But I think it's going to sound better if you maybe, you know, change the the structure or change a few sounds or bring in this or bring in that. That is essentially the 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 day to day of, of what I do. And and also, you know, when you're it's not we're a very connected team here. We have a, at the label. We have about 15 people who work here. So always talking to the rest of the team, the marketing team, the design team. You know, if if an artist has a question, it's kind of, as I say, sometimes it's, it's me that's the first point of contact or it's the A&R and then kind of chatting to the uh, the rest of the team and seeing who, who could pick up bits for those artists in that, in that respect as well. Okay, cool. And what would you say are the biggest difficulties? I mean, we've got all those juicy questions about what you're looking for, which we will get to. But I wanted to find out what the the biggest difficulties you face are. It's a good question. The biggest difficulties as an A and R, I think it's kind of I'm a people pleaser, so I never like to disappoint or to bring to to break bad news to people. I don't like doing that. That's not fun to do. But when you get the amount of demos that we do here, we I mean I've been doing it long enough as well that you kind of know straight away exactly what you want or what just feels right. I mean, it, this, it, there are so many ways of trying to put it eloquently, but it's difficult. And I think the difficulty sometimes is trying to it, communicate to artists why a record doesn't work for us. And it's there's only so many ways you can you can type it out unless you get on a phone call with them or you sit in the in in the studio with them and say. It doesn't work because this, that, and that. So sometimes it's ve- sometimes I do find it difficult to kind of go to people and say, this record is produced really well, it sounds great, blah, 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 but I'm really sorry, but it doesn't work for us. That That is a difficulty because, as, as like I say, there's only so many ways you can you can put it. Yeah, no, no, I, c- I can relate to that as well as, as someone who also gives feedback on music. And typing it out is hard, and actually it takes longer and more energy yeah. than just you know, jumping on a, a quick call sometimes. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now I can relate to that. So what would you say is, and this is one, a question that everyone always asks, but you know, what, what do A&R managers look for in a perfect artist? Uh, and I know that's, you know, pie in the sky, but well, any, yeah, any clues? I, I think first thing to say is there is no perfect artist. <laughs> right. There's no perfect artist anywhere in the world. But in terms of an artist who maybe is coming to the label new, I always say it's really important to have your own sound. So, and this is something that I discovered through my own experience as an artist. No label is particularly looking for something they have already. So when I get a demo and it sounds exactly like uh, an Estiva track or a Matt Fax track, and it's produced the same level, it might be great, but we've kind of already ticked that box and we're already doing that really well. So Mm. it's about finding the sound that works for you authentically as an artist 
and hoping that that matches up with color eyes for us. And uh, yeah, and, and I, th- I think that's the the crux of it. Basically, it always helps if you're a nice person. That's probably the second thing. I mean, let, let's just be honest. You know, it, this particular corner of dance music is exceptionally oversaturated in my opinion there are, there are so many records what it is i think it's friday today you know how many records have come out today on spotify and apple music you know so it does help if you're nice because it, no one wants to work with someone who's difficult however talented you are and we're actually in a very privileged position here at colorize enhance where we we don't have to we're not a major label we're not there just to hit TikTok and the rest of it. We want to work with nice people. We want to work with nice people who make good music. And I think that's not a bad thing to go by in life generally. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's that kind of brings a question that I've got myself. I'm always interested in finding what that that balance is because whilst you've mentioned that you're looking for someone with their own authentic sound, it's also got to, you know, satisfy certain criteria that you know that colorize is releasing so if and i know this is a hard question but is there maybe a ratio of originality to okay this fits our our vision do you know what i'm i'm always cautious about putting numbers on it um or a percentage on it obviously colorize has i i think in the last four to five years has really identified its sound. It's actually been around, Colorize has been around for 10 years. We're just doing our 500th release now, uh, this month. I think it's really difficult because because you could listen to the Colorize new releases playlist on Spotify, write a record like that and send it in and, it's, and it still wouldn't get signed. I think there is, obviously I get demos which are like, 135 BPM hard house and they say here's something for colorize and it's obviously oh, quite obvious that the artist hasn't looked at where or they've just blanket sent it out to everybody so you obviously have to have a certain vision of, or certain idea about what the label is that you're sending the, the music to yeah um, but like I say we're I think we're quite diverse in what we do you know we do have records from uh, you know we've got these new guys called Madeira they've just put out their album really beautiful soft cinematic but electronic sounds just really feels really nice and then at the other end we've got someone like Estiva who makes amazing banging club records I think for us the key I've always said this like the, the well I think we all, all believe the the key for our records here are is melody and it always has been with enhanced and in color eyes. Right. We I get a lot of records which are absolutely dance floor incredible I would play it tomorrow but if they don't move around enough melodically and I don't just mean in the breakdown I mean throughout the record those yeah. those records that just stay on the the tonic or the root note the whole way through. Yeah. That's that's not us. It might be a a record produced as well as a John Summit record. But if it doesn't fit with our our ethos about melody and melodic expansiveness and richness and fullness and texture, then mm. it's probably going to be a no, even if it's produced um, amazingly. So I think it's a, it's a delicate balance of having your own authentic sound, but seeing how it could fit into the color eyes world. But there is no golden rule. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... That's it, isn't it? It's art. So it's a hard, it's a hard thing to, to kind of gauge and quantify. And, and I think that's something that some people in some respects find it difficult. And I remember when I used to do it, and I'm talking like, you know, 10 years ago, you know, writing music, which I thought was the best records. And why is it not getting signed to Enhance? Because it sounds just like that other record that they had out. Or why is it not getting signed to Anjuna? Because it sounds just like that. But actually then you realise, but they don't want that. You know, they want they want something new, something they can grab onto, which fits into the world of this, the sonic world of the label. Yeah. But it, 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 isn't, it isn't a carbon copy of what they've got. How big of a factor is knowing someone in Colorize? But just more broadly i guess in in the industry in general do you think having personal connections prior connections with people counts for anything or is it really just okay we're receiving music from someone we've never heard of before it's great we love it let's do it it's the latter for me for us here right. it is the latter of course it's helpful when you when you know who's at the end of the email that you're writing to and you've had interactions with them yeah. um, that's just i think that's just a that's just a a genuine thing of life in 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 general yeah um, it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt but by no means is the door shut for people who don't have active networking connections at, at the label here we always say a good record is a good record and now that and i'm sure we'll come on to this potentially but that doesn't mean you know 
your numbers have to be through the roof on Spotify or through the roof on Instagram. A good record is a good record. We've we've broke many artists here who are now doing incredible things from Enhanced, but also also at Colorize as well. Yeah. Um, to name a few people like Claire, you know, who start he he sent his very first demo in 2020 to us by the demos at Inbox. We had no idea who he was. And it was just one of those moments, which happens quite rarely, I'd say, a handful of times I could count it on, on one hand, I think, in the last four years, where you, everybody in the meeting goes, wow, this is incredible. The production is different. It's new. It just feels great. And he's now doing incredible stuff. You know, he's touring. He is, he's got you know, over a million monthly listeners on Spotify. All of those, all those boring, in my opinion, boring, <laughs> boring things, the numbers and stuff. We didn't know who he was. We had no idea about him. But, you know, he sent his records and it sounded great. And we still do that. We, we, we've got other people that we still do that who are growing and building as well. Excellent. So that's going to be heartening for a lot of people who think that it is who you know. Um, no. Yeah. No. And I think that, and, and again, this is just me riffing on my personal experience, but now where people are so connected, you know, through social media and online, it's a very different ball game from maybe 20 years ago. Yeah. Honestly, like, sometimes I find it, refreshing when you get something from somebody you've never heard of you've had no interaction nothing on social media like it is it's refreshing because it's like wow like this is a completely blank canvas and we can do whatever we want here um yeah. as long as the music's good enough and that it just prompts a question well from my own mind as well which is when you listen to a piece of music and it catches your attention or the whole team's attention like that how soon uh, do you maybe skip forwards a minute or two into the track or do they just catch you like that straight off the bat with the intro? Depends if it's an extended mix or a radio edit. Um, but let's say it's, it's an extended mix. I'll usually get to one minute in because that's the yeah. more mixing, right? 32 bars for, for our genre of music. And we'll listen to it all the way through. If it's a record that I've listened to, I mean, don't forget, I'm listening to music all day in my headphones and I'm only taking into our A&R meetings the ones that I think we're going to sign or I think we might need some to do some work on, but I want to get a test, uh, test the water with the rest of the guys to see what they think. Listen, I, I know within the first 10 seconds of listening to a record from a production standpoint, whether we're going to have something we can work with or not. And if it, if I'm like, okay, this is, this is produced well, I'm going to listen to that whole record all the way through. Cause then that's the important bit of A&Ring. It's going, okay, well, it's a produced really well. It might need a few tweaks here and there, but is the breakdown a little bit sparse? Is the drop, um, uh, are we getting enough payoff at the drop? Is it big enough? So though, those are all the things that I'm listening to, then I'm critiquing it. But yeah, like I say, like I know within, I don't know, but every other a and I you talk to, you, you know, I mean, uh, if a record basically doesn't have any side chain or something and it's just a kick at, at, on top of everything, I'm going to know <laughs> within 10 yeah. seconds whether to move on to the next one and bin it, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And how do you separate your, and we've kind of touched upon it, but... Is there any way that uh, people can separate themselves from the other artists that you have on their labels and and um, stand out? Or is it really just the case of finding that authentic sound that's, that you just can't really define? It's it's honestly, well, it's so difficult because I feel like the artists that we work with do have their own distinct sound. And I think that's the main thing to keep in mind. And sometimes I get records from artists that we're working with and they're like, I took real inspiration from Blah Blah's record that you just put out a month ago, which is great. And I think it's really good to keep listening to, to the label you're signed to and keep keep listening. But I think the more you advance in your relationship with the label, the more individualism you you get to do, if you know what I mean. Like if the music's good, the production's good, and we're still feeling it, the more risks you can take because then you know you've, you've got a good home somewhere already and then i go actually do you know what that record you did two records ago that was that was the that was the bar let's try and see if we can raise it up and i and we, i do have that conversation a lot with artists that we sign regularly it's kind of like you know the the first few records were good but we've kind of fallen a bit flat because it, you need to move the sound on and that's something that every artist will experience in their career i've done it myself you know you get to a point where you think wow, I'm, I'm singing now. It's great. It's all going really well. But then you go, how do I move it on? How do I keep it fresh? How do I, you know, without using the same presets or the same kick or the same ride or the same, you know, all those, or the same effects, you know, yeah. you've got to keep your sound evolving the whole time as you become more of an established artist on a label. Okay, great. And if you were to, or if someone wants to produce full-time for a living, but they've got a full-time job, 
you know, like most people, we've all got to do what we need to do. And if they had three hours a day to produce, would you advise any particular focus on things other than music production, like social media, or would you suggest that someone just nails the the music production? I think you'd expect me to say, just do the music, just work on the production and, and everything else falls into place. No expectations. I think, yeah, I, I yeah. think I think we're in a we're at a place really now in 2024 where the other bits do matter. And you can see that. You can definitely see that with artists that we've built up already. But ultimately, I think the facts do still, the old A&R facts do stay true. And that is, it's all about the music. So you could have 100,000 TikTok followers, Instagram followers. If your music doesn't sound good, we're not going to sign it. So I would say if someone's working full time, focus on your production skills first and foremost. And if you're writing great music, which is getting played by great DJs on the radio, streaming like crazy, then people are going to come and find you. Yes, of course, we all work to keep that algorithm pumping out and we all we all love to, you know, try and grow grow your brand as such. But I think I'm still a little bit old school in that in that sense. It's like if the music's no good, then it's not going to get signed. Focus on the music. And that's I think I learned that from a lot of older artists that I've worked with in the past. Right. It's kind of like just focus on the really important bit and the and the rest of it should. Yes, you're gonna have to work you're gonna have to work to get your social media up and stuff, but the music is is first and foremost, right? Yeah. Uh and that leads me on to the next question, which is in this, you know, day and age where it's easy to self publish, what would you say the biggest benefits of signing with a label like Colorize or Enhanced are over and above self releasing? It's a really good question because, you know, a lot of artists are doing a lot more independent releasing on their own. I think what you miss out on really is working with a team. And my mantra in life has always been the most success comes out of collaboration with other people. No one is Superman or Superwoman when it comes to putting out music. Here we have a team, a huge marketing team. We have um, a big label team. And everything is coordinated for you. You have to, I mean, listen, As an, I think I have quite a privileged position of being an artist and an A&R. So I do see it from both sides. And yeah. I do see it like if a label is taking X percentage of this record, you want them to work for it. But by that, you know, they're going to distribute it. They, the, this label has amazing ties with DSPs. You know, our our playlisting, I think, is, a, is above a lot of other labels of our size. We get very, very good ads every week. We've got incredible connections with Sirius XM over the US. We get loads of spins on uh, Radio 1, Kiss FM. You know, all of these things is has been built out of 15 years of hard work from this label. And I think, yes, you could put out a record via DistroKid or, or, or whatever, whichever one you want to do. But if you want continued success... I, I think it does still uh, stand true that it's best to collaborate with other people and learn from them as well. How are you going to do your whole, all of your release assets, all of your, you know, everything on, on yourself, and you're going to care about the music as well? I think it's great to let other people collaborate with other people, and that lets you just focus on doing the music. And that is first and foremost the, the most important thing. That's exactly what I think as well, and that's what I advise my students to do is, you're kind of hacking into a pre-existing network of highly skilled people who are experts in that field. So whilst you might be giving away, you know, some of what you're you're earning, the big picture is you're going to be doing a lot more and you're going to be learning a lot more and it opens so many opportunities. So many opportunities, you know, for instance, you know, we've got new people who are on Colour Eyes and, you know, we, we're now doing a lot more events than we were, say, five years ago. So we do an ADE show every year. You know, we've got a Colorized London show coming up in May. All of these things, you can self-release the music. If and if your own if your only goal is to just put music out there, then fine. But if you want to grow as an artist, then I think it is about working with other people in, in the field, as you say. You also get to connect with other artists. You know, there's a part of my job is linking people together. Maybe we could do a collab between X and Y, all those things. And you just miss out on all of that if you just put stuff out on on your own. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And further to what you just mentioned about your night, upcoming night in May in London, I'll put a link to that below oh. as well. That's my old stomping ground in Hackney Wick. 
and also your 500th release as well. So congratulations on that. And I'll put a link below this video too. Cool. For anyone that's checked that out. Um, some very cool colored vinyl. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's basically uh, some of the most seminal records from the past um, 500 releases all on all on a vinyl and it's vinyl only so it won't be on beatport or in the stores anywhere the only way you're going to get your hands on it is on a vinyl nice and there's only a few left so be quick cool okay and regarding what you just said as well about well about having events and linking people up and all of that that kind of leads naturally onto the next question which i think you probably already answered is are you looking more to develop longer term relationships with your artists rather than one single and that's it yeah i mean that's actually a really good point because i think that's something that we've really focused on in the last six to twelve months here again like the label has done so well that actually now we do look for a long-term plan with artists listen if a great a great record is a great record as i keep saying but we live in a day and age where actually you could spend a thousand pounds and get one of the best producers in the world to make that record for you send it to a label it gets signed then i ask for more music and there and there's nothing Right. So I th- and I'm not saying that's happened to us, but we're you know we're very cautious of of doing that, and I and I think that's just sensible because I think I think that is where we find ourselves in in 2024. So when I get sent one record and it's knockout, I'm like, okay, this is wonderful. We'd like to sign it, but before we do, could you please send us some more music so we can hear what else you're working on, even if it's not finished. We just want to get a sense of where you're at, basically in your in your journey. Yeah, um, and I think that is that's something that we we like to do because then. Because then you can work with an artist closely, and and kind of and kind of see where see where they can go, rather than just signing one off records here, there, everywhere. It's all about for us more. It's definitely we're definitely moving into that uh, area where it's more of a long term focus. I think the label maybe when it first started 10, 10 years ago, Colorized ten years ago, was yeah. kind of you know just starting to you know the label was trying to grow itself by, by trying to establish its sound, which you can do on one off signings. But now it's. It's definitely more. That said, and then maybe we'll come on to this, please don't send 15 records in one go because, because I'm never going to listen to 15 records in one go from someone I've never heard of. When I'm kind of working with my students, I, I say that if we've got a stable of, say, three decent tracks yeah. and you approach a label, then you've got something to back up that you're not just a you know one trick pony or whatever the term is. Well, that, but that's it. And it's really important. You know, also, you know, the, you know, with so many sample packs and templates, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. You know, you could just buy a template, put it together, send it, you know, when I do see like make music like Colorize. And that's kind of something that's in my head when I'm li- listening to new music. I'm like, okay, could this be, is this at a level of a template? If so, we're not going to sign it. It needs to have more to it. And then you as an artist need to follow up with more as well. Yeah, I'm probably guilty for making some of those templates. No, 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 but they're, they're great. I think when you're starting out, I mean, I, I, my God, when I started making trance, I was, I was uh, using those templates as well. But for a record to get signed, it needs to just hit that extra bar. Yeah, they, I mean, when I give them away, I always put, look, be aware, this is really just for training purposes because yeah. loads of people have got access to it. So mm-hmm. being able to pick apart the production techniques, I think is a helpful thing for people to be able to do. But just repackaging something that someone else's work is is yeah. not a recipe for longevity. Exactly, yeah. And what would you say is the number one trait of your most successful artist? You know, let's give the kind of bar that they're all really good at producing. So that's a given. Is there any particular trait that makes you go, yeah, this person's going to be an absolute killer? I think it's kind of what I touched on before. It's about being... Uh, being able to keep your music fresh and new and not putting out the same sounding or sending to us the same sounding record every time it's not about being the loudest person or the loudest voice in the room it's not about partying as hard as you can or being the funniest person it is again about the music and if you can showcase your production skills and your again for us musical melodic skills as well then you're going to have success on colorize it might be different for other labels but for us that's it it's it's basically proving that you can keep your sound moving on and i'm thinking the one name in my head now is a guy called a steva a guy who i'm sure you guys are are familiar with you know the guy's been making music for 15 years since enhanced well i think about 12 years and he used to make trance and enhanced and he's managed to and then he went to armada he was doing stuff with armin 
And he's managed to just reposition his sound and reinvent his sound over and over again. And it's just every record we get is just like, wow, this is incredible. How does he do it? You know, so so does he manage to do that without moving so far from his sound that you can't tell it's him? Yeah. If there was anything like a golden ticket um, to, to being a great artist, it is that it's being able to go okay, here's my sound, here's what I do. And when I press play, I know it's in a Steve record, even if, if I couldn't see the screen, I would, I would know it's a record. But it doesn't sound anything like his last eight records that he's done for us. It's different and it's new. Every record right. sounds new, but still like in a Steve record. But that is, honestly, Will, I think that is the most difficult thing for an artist to try and establish, trying to keep it fresh. I struggle with it myself as an artist. And, and I speak to many artists, even those those big, big names that I've got in my head right now, like they, whenever I see them, they always say the same thing. How do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it moving? Yeah. Well, I guess if it was easy, then everyone would do it, you know? Exactly. And it's not, and you have to remember that when you're staring at your logic or your Ableton project and nothing's coming through, you have to think to yourself, well, if it was that easy, everyone would be doing it. And what would you say is the best way to get signs to colorize if people have got music that they think would be suited to your label what's the best way that they can get it to you definitely through so our main partner distribution partner is labelworks so if you go on labelworks.com or just type in demos colorize it will take you to them that is the best way obviously i get a lot of emails People obviously my email address is, is around and about, but that is the best way to do it. We listen to all of those demos. We listen to all of those demos. That's not a lie. We genuinely do. And then the best ones are are kind of sent up to me basically to to have a to have a listen to. But the A and R ears on the team here are so aligned. We've been so established as a team for a long time now. Yeah, for sure. The the label works demo box for colorize. Cool. And I'm going to ask a bit of a wild card question, but it's very pertinent now. And this is just like a, your personal opinion. What impact do you think that AI is going to have on music production and the music industry? It's a biggie. It's, it's a biggie. I don't know if I have all the answers to this one. <laughs> Listen, of course, as a creative myself, of course, it's it's daunting. That's the word I would use. I would you'd say daunting, not scary. I think it's a bit excessive. It's daunting. I like the idea of the possibilities it can create. And I have to be honest, like I haven't experimented myself. We have artists that do, but I haven't experimented myself, particularly with the AI world in music production. It's daunting because this is what we do for a living and this is art. And there's always, you know, as long as however many years you can remember, there's been a crossover between technology and art. When it gets to a point where it's so, so realistic and it's maybe writing better chord progressions than you then that's something to be concerned about we're getting to a point now of asking all artists when we sign them if they've used any ai records that doesn't mean it's a no or it's a yes we just want to keep a track of it and how it's going i think yeah. overall I, I think we need to kind of t- take a look at ai and what it's doing in the, in the whole world but i think it also creates a lot of opportunity and and um, a lot of exciting there's a lot there, there are plenty of things that could happen out of ai which are very exciting in music production i'm still on the fence yeah, I mean, I guess it's um, it, it happens every every generation. There's some, or well, a few times for our generation actually, where something completely game changing comes along and just. But there's so much opportunity there, from my perspective anyway. This is just my opinion, you know. It's happening, you know. So it's like, how how can we use these tools? How can we make them not put us all out of the need to make music (laughs) and you know the funny thing is though i feel like there is always something that comes around and and let's talk about if we talk about music production you know i'm not old enough to remember but perhaps in the 80s and the 90s when every time technology advanced people would say oh this is the end of songwriters or oh this is the end of whatever but this is something that's happening in society and we everywhere self-checkout tills for instance you know it's put a lot of people out of work we have to kind of adapt and grow with it. And if you don't, if, then you will get left behind. I'm not saying <laughs> make a record out of AI and send it to me in my, in my own world <laughs> at all. But you've got to try and work with it. It's not just, you know, we don't live in a, certainly where, where we are in the UK, we don't live under a government which is about to stop and ban everything to do with AI. So let's try and work with it and see how we can do it. And maybe some regulation is needed. Maybe not. Anyway. 
Okay, go yeah, on. Well, thank you for your honest views on it. And I guess it remains to be seen. Who knows, eh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great. Well, Adam, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to put a link to your May event. I wish I could come to that, actually, but I'm going to be in Ibiza, so I can't oh, really well. complain. What are, you, what are you seeing in Ibiza? Are you seeing anybody in Ibiza? Well, I'm going there for the IMS Oh, yeah, summit, cool, of course. So next week and then just kind of hanging around for a bit more because it's Ibiza. Nice. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> so we'll see how that plays out. But I'll also put a link to your 500th release as well below this video, as mentioned earlier. Cool. And yeah, once again, thanks so much for your time. I'm sure that um, the, the viewers have really got value from this. So much appreciated. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I, I really like EDM tips. You guys do some great stuff. Thank you. G <laughs> genuinely, like if, if there are people, and I know you've had a few of your students that have come through to Colorize from from learning from you so you know um please do send those demos i really hope i've the one thing i really hope to get across is that you don't need to be a big superstar or or um a loud personality to get your record signed to colorize just try and find your own sound and um and hope it aligns with with, with where we're at you know that's the other thing to mention right at the very end you know things are transient if you listen to colorized records from the last 10 years it's moved from place to place and right now we're in a we're in a specific place and and i think it's just about getting a good grasp of what that is and and and, and just going with it and also don't be disappointed if it's a no that's all that's all because because just the door is never shut yeah and that i think that's that's a really important point to to touch on when people get stopped with a no that's an opportunity to learn because every single music producer has made rubbish music at the beginning. Oh, and, God. and you think it's the best music ever. I've done that yeah. as well. And you go, why are they not signing this? It's amazing. And then you'll listen back to it in six or seven years time. You go, oh, actually, no, maybe, maybe it could. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> and, and actually, the last thing, sorry, maybe you didn't get to it, but. It took me a long time as an artist to to learn how to work with A&Rs because I would write records and think that's it. It's done. Bang let's go right. but actually when you work with a good a and r and you have a good rapport with them you kind of it's so much more beneficial to work with them and listen to them because they do nine nine times out of ten know what they're talking about i'm not talking about me but in my experience as an artist every a and r i've worked with their constructive feedback has helped the record sound the best it possibly can more ears are better than your own two ears and you know ultimately a label knows what it wants to fit into their groove if yeah. it goes so far away from the original record, fine, walk away and take it to another label. But try and work with the A&Rs because they, they nine times out of ten know what they're talking about. I'm really glad that we touched upon that, actually, because it's like a different mindset. You're then not thinking, OK, I'm sending this product to be released. It's like I'm beginning this, start, this next part of the process to get Always. it ready but, for release. But do try and get the records finished as much as you can and to, like to a point where you go, this is good enough to send to a label, but don't get it done, finished, sent off for mastering, stemmed out thinking it's just going to go because that honestly, that doesn't happen. That happens maybe one in, in 50 times we go sign it now, go you right. know, every time. It's like, actually for us, it needs this or maybe this, or, you know, have you thought about, putting a little vocal sample in that's a lot of a lot of the feedback i give like try and get something to make it more memorable than just a basic bed you know if you're listening to your record it just sounds like a something i could talk over on the radio it's probably not going to be a record that we're going to sign make it have Absolutely. some spark make it have something special about it make it have you know, something memorable that makes me want to go back and listen to it again and again and again and also don't be hampered in your creativity i'm sorry i'm going on now well sorry no 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 this is brilliant please, please continue if you've got and, the time and you know one thing that for instance right now i'm really struggling with with artists is this and it's not ai but it's what i call the drag and drop splice vocal thing and it's like this is your art this is your creative this is reflecting you this is what you want to put out to the world do you really want to take that top the first search result of, of a deep progressive vocal in f minor and just plonk it in your project is that really what you want to say about your music probably not and if you look at those big names yotto estiva all those guys who've gone before you like would they be happy just taking something and going yeah great great record done you've got to aim for the highest possible standard with your music even if you're starting out and i think by just take we've all done it by the way but i think we're now at a point where you hear the same vocal on so many records and it's not thinking outside the box enough we really want every record on colorized to be as authentic and as exciting for the listener as possible and having a vocal that you may have heard 
on two other records, you know, whenever, you know, six months ago, and then one before that. It's, yeah. not, it's not exciting and it's not where you should be aiming for for your music to be, in my opinion. And do you, I know now we are going on, but I think this is really important stuff. So would you hear a vocal from Splice and just, I guess if the music's good, then you would say, nice music, but we need a different vocal. Uh, that is probably 25 to 30% of my emails I send. It's This is really cool. I think sometimes it's good to look at Splice as like a, a stepping stone use a vocal to like fill out the record and like, so it doesn't feel like an instrumental version of a vocal record. Yeah. Um, Fill it out, but don't get so in love and attached to it that you can't live without it in your record. At the same time, I do understand the constraints of new producers um, working with vocalists. Um, Not everyone can afford what vocalists want. Not every vocalist wants to work with you. if, If you don't have the numbers, that's just the bare cold facts of it. But there are ways of being created with splice and there are ways of being created with with samples that is kind of, I guess, what we would look for as well in signings. It's like, cool, oh, they've done that, but you don't even know it's that. You know, that's that shows me that you've got the passion to to elevate yourself above everybody else. And like I said earlier in this interview, think about how many records come out every Friday. How is yours going to stand up so far head and shoulders above everybody else's records? If you don't want to do that, then fine, just put it out. But it probably won't get signed to a label like Colorize or or other competitors in our field or friends of ours in our, in our field. Um, yeah. Because we want every record to be as authentic and memorable and stand out as possible. That's what we have to aim for as a label. And that's what you in turn should aim for as an artist, I think. So it's it's about striving for excellence, really. It is. I mean, but wouldn't you do that in any, any other walk of life, you know? Uh, in personally, that I, I'm a big believer in that, yeah. And that's and that's and I think that's just crucial to succeeding, you know. Not to the point where, I mean, there is a fine balance because you can get to the point where you just back yourself into such a corner, you can't, you, you just become such a perfectionist, you never finish a record, you never send anything. You do have to find that balance, and I think in time you do, one would hope that you would find it. But you have to strive for excellence, like, you know. I say this sometimes to people, like, if you send a demo to a label and they go great thanks yeah we'll put it out next week in my and i've i've have got into hot water on twitter for that expressing that opinion before in my experience that's probably not the best label to sign your record to because you want to work with people to make the record sound as good as possible you want to know that they're signing so much other good music that they don't have space for you for another three months or something like that genuinely that's how i feel as an a and r someone who works at a label and also as an artist that's a red flag for me if a label says yeah great cool we'll sign it we'll put it out can you get us the masters now and here's the label contract it's like this is you know strive for excellence in in every form your creativity but also your business as well yeah yeah i think that's a really nice paradigm shift for a lot of people who might come to this thinking okay i just send it to a and r and then it gets released no yeah so i think that's (laughs) uh, yeah Work with it, and as I say, listen to the feedback if you can. And if you don't agree with it, then then do take it to somewhere that you feel like it could work. If you're not getting your record signed at all because you don't like the feedback from any A&Rs, then I think the problem potentially is with you rather than the, the record labels. Okay, on that merry note. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you know, do you, you, I mean, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, no, yeah, yeah, of course. You're getting uh, a no, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, or yes, change, yes, change, yes, but you don't want to do any of it and you have your own yeah. reason. Then may, maybe it's a self-releasing route, but then it does come with all the caveats of what we talked about earlier. You know, something I've seen in my students that go on to really do great things and release with labels such as Colorize is a willingness to take feedback and not to take it as a personal affront. I mean, and I did that for years and I, and I, I took it as a personal affront. Why, so did I. why would you not? Yeah. Exactly, you know, yeah. why would you not? But I think it comes with age and experience and I actively, when I send my records to other record labels, so yes, I release Enhanced, but I also do stuff on other labels. I want an A&R to say, this is cool, but could you do this, that and that? Because I know that it's only going to make the record better. I, yeah. I, in my experience, I've rarely had feedback which has made a, a record worse. Great. All right. Well, once again, thanks so much for your time, Adam. Is there anything else that you think is important that we should cover? No, I think we've uh, covered the whole landscape. No, it's, it's really good. And like I said, I want as many people to understand that Colorize is an open door for everybody and work on the production as hard as you can, because that is where it, that is where it starts. Without the production, there's no marketing, there's no record. So, you know, keep listening to Will. He knows what he's doing. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks, Adam. And thanks to everyone who's watched this interview and catch you soon. Thanks, Will. See you soon. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, a couple of our students have actually released on Colorized Records, so keep your eyes out for them over the coming months. And if you want to get coached to get your music to a level where it can be released on labels such as Colorize, then check out my Accelerator program below this video. Don't forget to check out the links I mentioned below as well for Colorize's 500th release and their upcoming event in East London. Thanks so much for watching, and if you want more A&R tips, you can check out this interview here where we speak to the A&R manager of Defected Records. But before you watch that, if you enjoyed this, please hit like and subscribe to the channel for more interviews like this. Thanks, and I'll catch you over at that next video.